Welcome to World Without Rule Law. What's your story? This week's guest, Lou, from the BC Bottoms channel. Hey, Tim, good morning. Hey, good morning, Lou. How are you? I'm good, sir. How are you? Good, good. I appreciate you joining me this morning. Um, oh, thanks for having us. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, for everybody out there in YouTube land, I'm talking to Lou from the BC Bottoms channel. And uh, Lou originally emailed me when I'd made a video about starting a new segment called What's Your Story? And I want to start a series of conversations, but kind of in the vein of um, the caller being anonymous and just like have it flow organically and uh, have that person tell their story. But as I was talking to Lou and um, I've been followers of his channel for a while, I think that we wanted to go in a different direction because we don't want it to be anonymous. I think Lou's, uh, Lou and his wife Gabby's story is awesome. It's, it's unique and uh, it speaks to my heart because in a lot of ways, it's similar to what I'm trying to do, um, maybe on a smaller scale with my place in Virginia. And um, it's a great testimony because uh, they're Christians and um, they have trusted God to lead them in, in this direction. And um, well, before I go too far, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Lou and I'm just going to let him, uh, you know, talk basically, you know, give us a basic rundown of uh, his channel, what he and his wife are doing, their kind of their story, and we'll go from there. So uh, take it away, Lou. All right, Tim. Well, hey, thanks for having us on this morning. I uh, appreciate your phone call, and it's always good to uh, talk with somebody who knows what we went through living in the north. I mean, you know yourself how it is up there, and without God, we couldn't have got out of there and got to the beautiful place we're at now. Um, now, granted, he puts us all in different places uh, in, in his vision, so, you know, you could make it, but it's just, it's very, very difficult, even on a good income, to live up in the north, and uh, full credit goes goes to our Lord and Savior for getting us down here. I mean, it's, Amen. it's Amen uh, that. yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, this job, I was working with a pilot in White Plains, New York, and uh I was looking for a couple of years, Gabby and I, to get down to Tennessee because we have some friends up in McEwen. So um, this pilot left the company where we were working for, and a couple of weeks later he calls me and says, hey, you know, I know you want to be in the Nashville area, but there's a uh, aircraft in Memphis that Jet's been managing for a while. Uh, I think you should check it out. So long story short, it was a long shot, but um, I called the DOM and ended up getting the job and moving down here. Wow. So just to touch a little bit on your, your background, you are a um, technician or a mechanic for uh, jet airplanes? Or, um, what exactly is it that you do, Lou? Yes, sir. I'm a uh, I'm an aircraft and power plant mechanic. And uh, what my job basically consists of is I'm managing an airplane for a corporation down here in Memphis. All right, so so you're you're living in Connecticut, which I agree and can attest to 100% is extremely difficult financially and um, socially and politically. I'll say too. And, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so you're working. You know, you're you got a little bit of a commute because you're going to. You said White Plains, New York, um, and a guy you work with moves down to Tennessee. And just so happens that was the area you guys had wanted to move to. So, yeah, I mean, I already I could see God all over this, right? So um, he contacts you and says, hey, there's this great opportunity. You guys end up moving down there. So um, now tell us a little about that. So you just pack up your car and you go, and now you're – you're. I think – and I'm going to let you tell it, but if, as I remember correctly, did you get – you guys rented at first for a little while? Yeah, so what what ended up happening, Tim, was um, it, this all happened really fast, too. I applied for the job in March, and by May, I think my hire date was like May 12th, um, I was hired, and what, it, what happened was there was supposed to be a little bit of time in between being hired and moving, but when I was in my uh, in-doc training, 
on that Friday, they said, you got to get on an airplane tomorrow and go to Milwaukee to finish the, uh, the pre-buy on the airplane and then ride it back to Memphis for a trip on Monday. So uh, I left that Saturday, the, you know, that day after that Friday, went to Milwaukee, got on the airplane, came to Memphis Monday morning, and by Monday afternoon, the plane was doing a trip. And I ended up actually living in a hotel for like a month and a half while Gabby uh, packed up the house all by herself. I mean, she got us ready to move. And oh. uh, I called my boss and I said, hey, man, listen, I said, I'm, uh, I'm going back to Connecticut to move my family because uh, this, you know, I've been on the road for a month and a half and, it, you know, I got to get my family down here. So he says, well, all right, maybe in a week we, we could get you home to, uh, to make the move. And I said, no, you don't understand. I said, I got a plane ticket and I'm getting on it this afternoon going back to Connecticut. So I basically went back for a weekend. We packed up a Penske truck and it was like Sanford and sons doing that. I mean, we literally, we took, we took our bed and our son's bed and our clothes and stuff and our, you know, personal belongings. And that was it. We had no furniture or nothing. Wow. Yep. So we did the move and uh, we found a house down here out, out in the County um, houses for rent. As soon as they get on the market for rent, they're, they're rented out by that afternoon. It happens very fast. So luckily we found a, uh, found a decent little house on six acres to rent. And um, that's, that's ultimately how we ended up finding this place was driving to and from the highway. So it was all, yeah, just kind of, you know, one, one couldn't have happened without the other. So, so again, there's God, right? There's his fingerprints on it. Cause he put you there and, put you in that rental, made that all happen, put this place right in front of you, you're driving by every day, and you, I think I remember from your video, you said you spotted a barn, and it was intriguing, you went and drove in one day to investigate, and yes, all right, so, uh, so now you're looking at this place, and there's no for sale sign on it or anything, right, like it's not, you didn't find it on realtor.com, you just saw it, so um, how do you go about pursuing the that the deal that you know leads to the closing of that? Okay, so um, in the in the summertime, you really can't see uh, the property. All you see is is a uh, just it looks like a farm road off off beaten path. And uh, you know we drove by it a hundred times and never realized it was here uh, until the fall came around and we saw the barn. So I pull in the driveway. Gabby and I walked the property probably three or four times just, just checking it out and said, you know, this is something we should look into. So we went down to the uh, county courthouse and looked up the tax records for it. And the woman uh, who owned it, they had two different addresses for her, and neither one of the addresses uh, was was accurate for her. So the tax bills they were sending her were getting kicked back and it was, it was going on its fourth year in delinquency for taxes. Oh, wow. So that following September, it would have been sold on the courthouse steps or auctioned off. And we ended up, so it's funny too, because the way we found our church was from looking for the owner of this property. And that's how we met our neighbors down the road and ended up, ended up finding our church home. So now this person that owned this property, they had no idea that the, um, you know, the taxes were, or it was heading toward a tax sale? No, sir, they didn't. And I wow. told Gabby, too, I said, you know, even if we got to pay a couple of years worth of taxes to make sure it doesn't get sold. Because, Tim, I don't agree with the government coming in and taking somebody's property just because they're behind a few years on their taxes. I mean, Right. You know, it, it happens to a lot of people and, and they lose they lose everything they work for just over taxes. Yeah, yeah it's it, it is sad. And 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 I agree. I don't believe they should have the right to do that. No. Nope. So um, long story short. Trying to find her through the tax information wasn't happening. So um, the woman down the road, she's she's in her mid 80s and she's still sharp as a tax. But, you know, she's, she's like our grandmother down here, but, um, her grand, great granddaughter, um, no, her granddaughter. Yeah. It's her granddaughter. Uh, she was friends with the property owner's daughter on Facebook and she ended up getting in touch with her, which is how we got the landowner's phone number. 
And uh, that's when, you know, we go into the story where we contacted her. She said she wasn't interested in selling. And we just kept in touch and, you know, let let God take over. Wow. So that's so, so okay. So when you contacted her, then, um, how, I mean, how does that conversation go? Like you, you, I'm sure you introduce yourself. You told her you're interested in buying it. She's not interested. At some point, you obviously, or not obviously, but I imagine you must have told her at some point about the tax delinquency and where all that was heading. Um, how did how did all that unfold? Yeah, so what happened was we called her and she didn't answer. So I sent her a text and said, hi, you know, my name's Lou and my wife Gabby and I are interested in your property. Um, I understand you might be interested in selling it. So she, she then uh, texted us back and said, uh, no, not interested. Thanks for your interest. So I said, well, I said, okay. I said, that's fine. I said, I just need you to know, though, it's it's in delinquency with the taxes, and they're going to auction it off in the courthouse steps come September. So she said, well, thank you. I'll take care of that. Wow. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, we ended up buying the property before that September, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all the taxes had to be paid up on it and whatnot. And so, you know, just to look at it from a little different direction, too, uh, kudos to you and Gabby, because, I mean, if your intentions weren't as um, good, you know, let's just say, you could have just did nothing and sat back and waited and attended the auction and tried to buy the house for, you know, what was owed on the taxes, right? Yeah, and we had some uh, we had some cash. We could have done that, absolutely, and we probably could have got it for a lot cheaper than what we did. But, you know, again, morally, that's not something we're going to do. There's actually a uh, – there's a piece of land behind me. There's, there's eight acres. That's two years back. And, uh, you know, I got the guy's address from the, the tax information and sent him a letter. So I don't know if he ever took care of it yet or whatnot, but – Hmm. Um, well, yeah, it's just just something. That's like one of my pet peeves, you know. Yeah, well, I commend you for that. That was, uh, you know, that's that's pretty refreshing to see that that approach and that attitude. And again, I I know um, preaching to the choir, but I know that when you have a relationship with Christ, and you know, when you you try to live according to the precepts of the Bible, and you have a moral standard, this is how you, you know, this is how you conduct yourself. And I think it's important to note that because, um, again, a lot of people, um, and to be honest, I mean, I would like to think that I would not have done it, but I'm sure it would have been tempting to just sit back and just wait for that clock to run out and, you know, swoop in and, you know, and we look at the world and how people operate. I think that's how some people, you know, make fortunes. So, um, so again, you know, I commend you for, for doing that. And I think it shows a lot about who you guys are. Well, I appreciate that, Tim. And, and you're right. I mean, the, the actually the house we rented, it was actually a, like a double wide trailer. But that property, that landlord acquired a lot of his properties through uh, tax sales. And he says uh, they they have what's called a one year right of redemption, where the owner could come and legally within that one year, if they want to buy the property back from you, they they could buy it back for for uh, what you paid plus ten percent. So he said, you know, you sit back, you wait that year, and then they can't do anything. And mm. you know, I was just thinking like, man, you know, it was a little old woman who owned uh, that property we rented. And uh, he he owned the house for years prior to us renting it, but uh, the neighbors were telling me the story about the woman that used to live there, and what it what all had happened with it. And it's just it's you know it's a terrible thing to not only uh, buy a house through an auction, but sit back for a year and keep quiet about you know that you just bought it and these people yeah. are going to lose their property. Yeah, and in your case, I mean, that year probably would have went by pretty uneventfully because if they didn't have any information, uh, contact information for the lady that you purchased it from, then they have no way to let her know that it's been sold. So she just, if she's already a couple of years in the rears, um, she could just let that last year go by without even realizing what was going on. And then one day in the future, she figures it out. And then all of a sudden now it's too late. And it's a little odd how that happened. Like, 
and I, and people are different and she's older i guess i don't know but okay so you're you're the owner of this property how do you not pay the taxes for two years or whatever and not realize that you know something's going to be happening behind the scenes because of that um yeah and and i don't know i mean me personally i can't see owning a piece of property and just forgetting about it but uh she did move out of state she was in missouri and uh they don't exactly you know try to get a hold of you via phone or anything they just send letters out to the last known address sure and it's a it's the same thing when they sell it on the courthouse steps they don't get in touch with you and say hey we sold your property they put an ad in the paper and say hey your property or this property was sold at auction you know the owner so and so has has a one year right of redemption so yeah. i mean if you don't read a newspaper you you're never going to know Wow, and then she's in a situation where she's living out of state and they don't have her address. So basically, yep. there would have even if they wanted to go the extra mile to contact her, they wouldn't really have been successful. So nope, that that's interesting. It's interesting how that all works, and you know, and I, I agree with you. I don't think it's right that they should be able to just come in and you know, I mean, like, so you own the property. It's not like it's one thing if you know you go out and buy a new truck and you stop making the payments for it then whoever, you know, owns the debt can come in and take the truck and sell it to recoup the debt, like the bank or the finance company or whatever. But in, yeah. in this case, okay, the properties, she obviously, uh, not obviously, but I'm assuming at that point she didn't have any debt on it. She owned it outright. So, and, and even if she did, it's not the bank that's coming in and taking it. It's the county or the state or the town. Because That's they're right. saying like, well, you haven't paid your taxes in two years. So yep. to me, it seems like it way it should work. And of course, what I, I mean, it works the way it works. Whatever I think doesn't matter. But I think, you know, a fairer way would be for them to maybe take her to court to sue her for that money. Um, I don't the, understand. Yeah, that would be more fair. Yeah, I don't understand how they automatically have the right to take possession of the property. <laughs> well, it all, I mean, it all goes, and it, and it, I mean, if you, if you look at your story for a, for a comparison, I mean, you know, those people have essentially lost all their rights in the story and, and that's the way this country's heading. And yeah. I mean, if you, you know, you look at somebody just being able to come and take your property and, and auction it off for what the taxes are owed. I mean, it's the same thing. It's a degradation of our, of our uh, constitutional rights. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's, I'm sure there's things behind the scenes, you know, you're the clerk of the works or the, you know, tax assessor or whoever it is that decides this property is going up for auction. Um, you know, do you have a relationship with people like this guy that goes around buying up the properties? Do you call him and say, Hey, you know, next week, this property is going here. This is what's owed on taxes. And that doesn't seem yeah. right either, but I'm sure that happens every day too. Oh, I'm sure it does. And, you know, they you hear about government corruption and you don't. So not to get off track, but you never realize it's actually out there till it happens to you. Uh, for instance, we just had um, I called the electrical inspector out to give us the final OK. And I mean, he's he's a uh, he's kind of a kooky old man. So he comes out. And he's you know, he's saying um, you can't have this. And I said, well, the National Electric Code doesn't say what what you're saying so at the end of the day Tim um, he didn't pass us and I was going to do a video about this but I said nah you know move on you know but um he didn't pass us because his reasoning was you have to have a local electrician down here uh, to okay everything and I said well you know my father's been an electrician for the last 50 years and so is my uncle and they were both here uh you know, kind of guiding me through this. And he says, well, they're not local guys. So uh, yeah. the pastor of our church came over that day to bring me a radio. And I told him what had happened. And he said, well, at Salem, we have two local electricians, so I will put you in touch. So that following morning, he went out to breakfast with, you know, like call it the good old boys club, the, yeah. the older gentlemen who meet at the gas station in the morning. <laughs> and it's, as soon as he mentioned this inspector's name, they started laughing and said, oh, he's crazy. And they said, the reason he needs to get 
a, uh, a local electrician is so he could get his payoff. And I've heard this from four different people now. So, yeah, he's he's looking for his hundred dollar payoff. And if he would have just told me, hey, you know, here's g- give me a hundred bucks and we'll call it good. I I mean, yeah. I would have done that just because I'm ready for, for I'm ready for this meter to be moved to the house so I could get rid of the temporary service. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So it's what they call the authority having jurisdiction, right? Like comes down to the bottom line is no matter what the national codes say. You got this local guy. We see that up here, too. And um, uh, I'm actually an electrical contractor in this state. Um, Oh, okay. I I work for the the town. I haven't, you know, I don't actively do that really anymore, but I just help out friends and stuff like that. But there was a time when I did it full time. And um, you see that all the time. Um, You get a guy who's an inspector and doesn't maybe have the best knowledge of the code or they have their certain things. Each one's different. So, like, they'll have a few things that they specifically look at. And then if there's anything else that they're, excuse me, not clear about, then they kind of just gloss over it. And so once you get to know the inspector, you know what it is they look for and you just approach it to satisfy their needs and um then you know you'll get you'll get that one that'll say you know come up with something crazy and you, you know you you try to politely tell them well that's not in the code i mean can you show me where it says that in the code book and that you you know that's a losing argument because in the end they're the the authority having jurisdiction and basically comes down to well even though the code doesn't delineate on that one fact this is my that's thing, right. and this is the way i want it and you know we <clears throat> think that whole thing is, you know, and I, and I guess it is getting off track a little, but since we're talking about it, I just want to touch on this a little that, you know, back in the day, like electrical and all inspectors were put on to protect the homeowner and the consumer from shoddy contractors, you know, That's contractors right. that do shoddy work or that are dishonest. They were placed to hold the contractor's feet to the fire to protect the end user, the consumer, the homeowner. Um, yes. And it's so flipped around now that, you know, these guys are, they're going in and they're making the homeowner's lives miserable in a lot of cases. And it really was never meant to be that way. No, sir, it wasn't. And that's, that's just the, the just fun with things is, you know, authority that can be abused will be abused. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good point. Um, so, okay, so now you got this place, it's, I think, 15 acres, right? So is that what you... Yeah, fi- 15 acres, yes, 15 sir. acres, yeah. So you got this house that you're working on that, and I mean, okay, so I'm doing a project in Virginia, too, so I know right away, like, that's kind of open-ended. I mean, we could <laughs> spend the rest of our lives doing that, right? But then oh, you yeah. got all this land, now... You, now um, and you've touched about it on you know a little bit of in some of your videos. I know you're a deer hunter, but what are your plans for as far as like homesteading animals? You have animals in your future, gardening, crops. Like, what what are you looking to like? What does the future hold for you guys there on that property? So, uh, Lord willing, to see is um, as as food independent as we can be. Um, we have. You know, most of our back pasture is just that. It's it's intended to be in land for the horses and cows and goats. Uh, we got some some fence to touch up before we could release the goats back to it. But uh, springtime, we want to get a couple dairy cows and and maybe one or two more uh, beef cows. And then uh, I've actually I I was up at five o'clock this morning because I couldn't sleep and um, I was planning out the garden for this coming spring. And uh, that, that's, you know, I've tried growing a garden for a lot of years, and, and the, the easy things are easy to grow, but planning it out so that you could live off it takes a lot of work. And that's that's basically yeah. Yeah. what the goal is, is to be able to uh, grow our own food. And, you know, obviously you're not as of it as we can do. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think I think as far as prepping goes, like, you need to prep and you need to put stuff back, but you also have to be able to replenish. Absolutely. And I think Absolutely. I think uh, homesteading and prepping go hand in hand, in my opinion. I, I 100% agree. 
And I think self-sufficiency um, is more of a goal or, you know, more of like a goal than a, than a end result, right? Like, I don't think we could ever get to be completely 100% self-sufficient or not that we can't, but I think it's a, you know, maybe be able to get a good part of the way fairly easily, but then the last bit, like for instance, if you have animals, right? So to be completely self-sufficient, you would have to be able to grow the food for your animals as well. I mean, yeah, that's right. total meltdown where there's no supplies coming in, you got, you know, you got, you got to feed these animals. So you, um, I think total self-sufficiency is 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 tough. I think it could be hard to achieve. But then again, anywhere you can end up on that scale, if you end up at 50%, 60, 80, whatever, is is a step in the right direction. And I think it's great that you're doing that. Yeah, and it's it's like you said, it really is. It's a never-ending goal, you know. And uh I mean, I asked a, a friend of mine down the road that we go to church with. He's older. He's he's in his uh, mid sixties, and he's he's got a bunch of cattle. And you know, I said, "Hey Ray, I said, what do you guys do when you when you were kids and you didn't have all this machinery? And I mean, they didn't have power out here till like the early eighties. Wow. So he said, uh, you know, he said the cows got real skinny in the winter, and some of them even died. So that's, uh, I mean." You, I don't see how people could do it where they could grow all their own food for the animals and themselves and, and you know, live on a level like we do today. Yeah. Well, that, I think that's an important thing to note, too. I mean, like you, you say, living on the level that we do today. I mean, we as Americans, um, we're kind of rolling in the plenty anyway, right? Like um, maybe more so than we need to. I think um, I watched other channels, and I I watch a guy that you know, um, they he talks a lot about this. But like we as Americans, if the let's just say worst case scenario, the whole entire you know world was cast into darkness tomorrow and set back into the 1800s, we as Americans have a lot further to fall than a lot of other places. Um, yep. Some places are they wouldn't even know that that happened because they're already living like that anyway. Um, yeah. And that, that's a hundred percent accurate. I mean, I, and it, and it's funny too, because people I talk to that I work with and, and everything else, I mean, they have no idea. Like they, they just, they don't even comprehend that that could ever possibly happen. Yeah. They think, well, it could never happen. Right. And it, you know, these hurricanes, Tim are, are a great example. We flew down to St. Thomas three weeks ago. Um, because they, they were doing a thing down there. And um, they there was nowhere for, for the clients to stay. The, the hotels are shut down for, they said they're at least 18 months out. Wow. Um, there's hardly any power on the island. And this isn't just St. Thomas. This is uh, Puerto Rico and, and all those other little island chains down there. Um, those people are literally, if they were living on any, time, any type of first world basis, they're now living on a third world basis, no power, yeah, no clean it's water. It's going to be like that for quite a while, right? I mean, they're not yes, it is. to be restored anytime soon. No. So they, what we had to do was we had to fly to Miami overnight in Miami and leave at four o'clock in the morning to get them to their meetings in St. Thomas for eight or nine o'clock, whatever time it was. And then they had to fly back that afternoon. So uh -huh. it's, you know, I, I say to these guys, I say, I mean, you think it can't happen here, but yet look at these islands that, that are popular vacation spots that have all the amenities and they don't anymore. Wow. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's, right. And that, so when that happens to, you know, mainland America, um, hopefully it never will, but if, if, and when it does, then we're going to just be in a whole different world. Like, you know, overnight or in the flash of an eye or whatever. And so I think, I think that's interesting. And, and like you say too, we, we work with and we, you know, see and interact with every single day people that have no clue of that and are just walking around with that naivete and that belief that that can never happen. And we've had power and all this stuff ever since the day I was born. So it's never going to go away. And, That's I, right. and I hope they're right. I hope it doesn't go away. But 
obviously we have to prepare for the day that it does because I think that you know when we and I know you touched this touched on this on this in one of your video your intro video but when you're living in a society that you know is twenty trillion dollars in debt and all the unfunded liabilities that the country holds and and then mm -hmm. that's just the the surface because when you look at the causation of that and I I agree a hundred percent it's you know, with what you, what you said in your intro video, that it's because of the lack of God in our society, in our schools. Like, you know, we threw the Bibles and we threw God out of the schools. And um, so now he's not in the schools. He's not in public education anymore. And so That's we're right. now, I mean, that happened in the early 60s, right? So we're at least two full generations into that, you know, into a society that was trained without the virtue of God or, you know, any consideration for biblical doctrines or precepts. And we're seeing the effects on that. We're seeing the effects that has on society, um, you know, in, in even in politics and society, in every aspect of our lives, we're seeing it. And not, not only did they take it out of the schools, Tim, but they're making it so that it's illegal to mention God and uh, societal norms are now, you know, if, if you like, what I'm doing now is, is I'm learning how to, how to share the gospel and, and evangelism. And man, when you go out into public and, and try to talk to people, it's, it's almost frowned upon to, to talk yeah. about God, yeah. especially in, in the city areas. So it's not only coming out of our schools, but the societal norms now are, you know, even people who go to church, they, a lot of them just go to church and they just go to church to do their, their hour on Sunday morning and then they're good for the rest of the week. Yeah, very true. And, very true. As yeah. you know, that's that's not how Christianity works. That's not how God works. No, no, it's it's you know, we're commanded to preach the gospel to all creatures, right? So um that's our neighbors who we interact with every day and um and so then there's aspects of that because some people, you know, they'll come at they'll come at that with such a vigor and such a, a force that it's almost a turn off. I think the key in sharing the gospel is to get it to be organic and ha yes. have it flow naturally in in everyday conversation with people. And and that could be tough sometimes, but um you know, the command is to share the gospel, it's not to beat people over the head with it. Or, you know, oh, it's, absolutely! It's our and, responsibility and all, to tell them, not to necessarily convince them. That that's up to Christ. That's up to God. You know, that, that's absolutely right. All we could do is plant the seed, and you know, if they got questions, hopefully we could try to answer them. I I actually have a book uh, in my hand right now. Since uh, you mentioned this uh, and beating people over the heads, there's a, a book by this this author named Bob Tide T I E D E. And it's called Great Leaders Ask Questions. Oh. And um, he's he's a Christian man, and he wrote this book uh, for, I don't know, I guess like big corporations and stuff and leadership conferences. But uh, there's a lot of scripture referenced in it, too. Um, and, you know, Jesus, he preached, but he also preached a lot by asking questions rather than saying, you know, do what I'm telling you to do. And uh, it's, it's a great book if you guys ever get a chance. It was always his lessons were most of the time were framed in the form of That's a question. Fair. Yep. That's so, interesting. I'm going to have to look for that. I'm going to have to look for that book. Yeah, well, I got two copies of it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it really is a scary world we're living in. And, and the uh, yeah, just the, the, the rate at which we're turning away from crisis is, is just, it's scary if you sit down and think about it. Yeah. And, and we, you know, look at, I mean, throughout the history of the world, empires have fallen and we look at the accounts in the Bible. I mean, there's consequences for that, how God's going to judge us and judge this nation. And it's sad that, you know, we we can read that and know that, and yet we're still going down this road. You know, we talk about the public schools, right? So just just get off the side a little bit. But I I work in a public school, so I see a lot of that, and it's 
completely, completely out of control, fundamentally broken at every single aspect of it, at least where I am, you know, in Connecticut. And uh, I'm sure it's like that in a lot of places. But you mentioned homeschooling your kids. And I just want to say, like, kudos to you and your wife for making that decision. Um, I know it's not easy. I know it can be, you know, a big job. And it's a big responsibility. But um, I think that that is so huge in turning things around is giving kids the education that is important. You know, so not only teaching them to learn to read and to write and to all that, but um, also bringing God into that and, and teaching them, giving them a moral foundation and how to treat other people, how to respect other people and um, something that the public school, and, and I'm, it's not the teachers or the administrators, really, it's it's the kids are bringing it with them because they're getting it from their families. I mean, the families are were always meant to be the first line of education. Absolutely. And and people don't realize that. They they think it's, you know, well, it's the school's job to teach my kids what they need to know about life. And, and that can't be further from the truth. I mean, schools were there so um, so they could have a common education and, and um, you know, they had somebody with the ability to teach, not – not that it's, you know, it's, the, I mean, it, like you said, it, it starts in the home and Absolutely. the way to, the way to change this country and the schools is to start with the home. I mean, it's not the teacher's job, it's our kids, it's our job. Absolutely. And if you even, I'm sure even if you ask the teachers uh, where you work, they'll tell you, no, it's our job to teach these kids what they need to know. And what a lot of schools do too is, you know, K through through 12, they're teaching kids or preparing them for college. And it's like, well, I mean, I never went to college. I got out of high school, went to a trade school, and, and was working the whole time. Yep. And the goal of school is, is should be and was originally, uh, A, to, to teach kids about God, and B, uh, to get them ready for the world, not, not get them ready for college. I mean, yeah. college, in my opinion, these days is a waste of time. Absolutely. I agree. I mean, it's it enslaves you in such debt and to me you're better off going to serve an apprenticeship with a plumber and getting your plumbing yep. license you know or whatever because i think that we're seeing also a society that um doesn't really want to work hard like that doesn't want to work with their hands and i think if if we have young people that are willing to do that i think in another 10 years they're going to be on top of the world they're going to be able to write their own ticket because I think in 10 years, and we're seeing it even now, but another, going forward another 10, 15 years, there's going to be less people willing to do the trades work, you know, than there was 15 years ago. And that shift is, you know, it's supply and demand, right? So you have fewer people doing it. There's going to be the demand for those individuals is going to go up. They're going to be able to make more money. They're going to have more control over all those aspects. Um, you know, when we, we look at the public schools, I mean, just to – and I I see teachers on both ends of the spectrum, so I'm not in a position where I really want to defend them. But on the other hand, I will say that I know and you know talk to some really wonderful, really dedicated teachers, and they you know it's it, it kind of you can see it hurts them that we're going in this direction. And a lot of it are the older school you know old school teachers that. Maybe yes. they're almost ready to retire, but they remember those days when things were different, and they they just they have no control because you know when we were kids we went to school with a ruler or a pencil and a notebook you know on the first day these kids they come in with you know an, a bad attitude and a lawyer on their speed dial so like yeah that's it you can't even look at these kids wrong there's no discipline. And if they're not being disciplined at home, how are the teachers su supposed to get any kind of respect? Or you know, they're not teachers aren't allowed to discipline the kids. They're they're just no. not not in this day and age. So is that their fault? I don't not necessarily. Um, no, it's it's. I mean, they can only work within the the process that they're given. I mean, it's you know it's a double edged sword, you know. And and something else I think that feeds into it big time. And, and you see it whenever you go out into public is, and not to knock technology, 
but uh, technology, I can remember, Tim, in 2007, no, yeah, 2007, I was working on, a, on an airplane, and the avionics guy came in, and he had a, a brand new iPhone. <laughs> you know, we're all looking at it like, what is that? You know, it has a touch screen, and you can make a phone call or use the internet. And here we are from, from 27 to 2017, 10 years later, and it's, it's, you know, everybody's got a smart device. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, think a, I think a big part of uh, how, why we're going downhill so fast is, I mean, kids are just glued to video games and their tablets and their cell phones. And, I mean, to the point where they're walking around the grocery store or the mall staring at a phone. Yeah. Yep. And we, you know, if we look at the history of time, let's just take, you know, since the, since the 1600s, I mean, let, let's take a four or 500 year period of time. In 400 years, the first 350 of those years, you know, we we made progression that equals an inch. And then in the last 50 years, we've made, you know, a progression that equals a mile. So it's yep. like it's rapidly, you know, um, it's rapidly like expanding and I, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, like, so not to get into like end times prophecy and all that, but then, you know, if you read the Bible, I mean, it talks about like, um, the time when the time is getting close, like the increase of knowledge and to, to be able to travel to and fro. I mean, that that's happening. We increase the knowledge. It's like, look at the internet. Isn't that exactly oh, yeah. what, you know, encompasses that you can go on and you can there's no piece of information in the world practically you can't find at your fingertips in five minutes from sitting at your computer oh and, that's right and the same thing too with you know traveling to and fro i mean you can go and get on a plane and be in china and however many hours it takes to fly to china whereas that's it. Yep. 100 years ago that was an impossible journey not impossible but it was a journey of a lifetime uh, I mean, to go, there was a point in this country where to go from New York to San Francisco was a journey of a lifetime. And yeah. And now yep. you can do it three times in one day if you wanted to. That's right. That's right. And it, it, I mean, it really is scary. And I talk all the time about this with Gabby and, and friends of mine that, you know, we rely so heavily on technology that, I mean, everything is controlled by it. You know, and you look at, um, even, even aside from, from prepping for worst case scenarios, I mean, people should be prepping for uh, the every the things that happen every year, like uh, say snowstorms, where if you're if you're stuck in your house for a week, or you know, um, whatever, an earthquake or Absolutely. something, and the, the trucks can't get to the grocery store because the grocery stores are filled up every day. And we're see we're seeing that stuff's happening. I mean, like a few years back, we had that up here in the Northeast. I don't know if you were still here then or exactly when you moved, but we had that um, ice storm in October, right around Halloween, and um, yep. where I am in Connecticut, I mean, I lost power for seven days. And now that's the same same with us. And then, so the very year after that, we lived on a hill, and uh, the year after that, I think, I think it was, I want to say October, but I don't think it was October. It had to be a little bit later in the year than that. But we had a snowstorm, and I'm sure you remember it. But the snow came down so hard and heavy that the plows couldn't keep up with it. Our road didn't yeah. get plowed for eight days. I do remember that. You know, I had to, I remember riding a sled down the hill to, to meet up with my father so I could borrow his truck to go to work. Just because, I mean, there was, it was chest deep and you couldn't, you know, thank God we didn't lose power that time because there were elderly folks up there that would have been in some real trouble if we had lost power. Yeah. I mean, you weren't, get, you weren't getting an ambulance up the road. So we talk about prepping. I mean, those are the things that, well, everybody goes to like, oh, you're prepping for the apocalypse or for the big EMP to hit or whatever. But you're right. I mean, prepping can be just as simple as covering yourself in these, you know, have, not having power for a week or a huge snowstorm where you can't get out of the house to get groceries. And, and it is scary when you look at people that don't have a clue. And and then a lot of these older people that, you know, maybe they have a clue but don't have the means, um, yep. it puts them in a bad spot. And it, and it when you go for a week like that without power or through one of those big snowstorms, you, you think you see, if you're awake, right, you can just see, like, how easily it could all fall apart or how quickly it could all fall apart. 
Oh, and it, like you said earlier, it could happen. I mean, I know it, it doesn't happen at the snap of a finger, but I mean, when you're talking overnight where, you know, and not, not only are, are you limited with what you could do because of whatever the environment threw at you, but you really see how nasty people could be after just a day or two of not mm-hmm. like uh, that, that ice storm. We, we would go shower down at the marina because there was no, there was no hot water. You know, and you would just get near a gas station where the line was a mile long, and people were calling you every name in the book, ready to throw fists, and all you were doing was driving by. Yeah. So pe- people get nasty. Oh yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, I was in New York and Queens after the after Sandy Hurricane Sandy. Um, yeah. The, a pastor uh, of my church, the church I go to, our pastor, his brother-in-law is a pastor of a church in Queens. And they have a like a satellite ministry that's out right on the beach, and oh, they were wow. just setting it up. And so we brought because they couldn't even like get gas cans to put gas in. Literally, if you went to Walmart or Home Depot or wherever in the outer lying areas, they were sold out of all that stuff and generators. And they were coming up into Fairfield County, and it was sold out there. So we're up in Northwest Connecticut, and so our pastor put the, you know, put the plea out, like, we we're going to get together a bunch of stuff and a bunch of guys, and we're going to go down there, and we're going to, you know, see what we can do to assist them. So we took our van, and we had some generators and some water pumps to help people pump their basements out, and um, we, people contributed gas cans, and we put them in a pickup truck, and we brought gas down, and then they had the cans to try to refill, but I remember... I think it was Queens Boulevard trying to get gas. There was a line in a gas station. Uh, it had to be a half a mile long. I mean, that might be a little exaggeration, but I, I don't think so. And there was one of the pastor's people was waiting in line, and they had been there for hours and hours and hours, and then they ran out of gas, like, when he was oh. like, within 20 cars to the pump or whatever. So they came back and just told everybody, like, okay, just go home. And I'm like, and that's how crazy it was. But, you know, when you talk about attitudes like these people, it gets ugly in that situation. And if you extend that on another week or another month. Oh, I mean, God, I don't even want to see it. Yeah, it's scary. It really is. It's scary stuff. Um, I think. Well, if, if it's any consolation, Tim, you guys are making the right move by, by doing what you're doing and getting down to Virginia. And, yeah, and I think I think you guys will be all right down there. I, I think so. We got a lot. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir telling you because I think you, you're living it too, but we got a lot of work to do on the house and we got, you know, there's some things we got to do, but I'm actually going down for two weeks trying to just keep moving ahead with my, I get taking a couple of weeks vacation and just trying to get the house nice. ready because at some point fairly soon here, I'd like to be able to get down there full time. So uh, we're just moving in that direction where it's like the self-sufficiency thing. Like, right. We we're just taking a bite of the elephant one bite at a time. You know, you, you can't, if you look at the whole entire picture, it's overwhelming. But if you look at just what am I going to do this week or these two weeks when I go, then that's kind of how I'm approaching it for now. And, well, and that's, that's how you got to approach it. Cause I, I could tell you, we've been working on this house and this property for two years and, you know, I look outside and I see the improvements, but I also see how far we have to go. Yeah. And it's it gets overwhelming, but you just, you know, you take it one fence run at a time, one piece of sheetrock at a time, and yep. hey, before you know it, you got sheetrock on the walls. <laughs> yeah, I, that's a great attitude. I think that's the attitude we need going into this. But, well, we're we're going long, Lou. I guess this probably be a kind of a good place to cut it off. Um, i like to thank you for doing the call and um, it's been interesting talking to you. I think you guys got a great channel. I think your story is super interesting. You got a good testimony. And um, I, I'd like to invite all my subscribers to go over to BC Bottoms and check it out. And, uh, you know, subscribe, uh, watch some of his videos, see what they're doing, follow them on their journey. They're they're great people. And I just encourage everybody to do that. Actually, I'm going to put a link in the description um, to your intro video. So, um, hopefully we'll get some people to to go over and introduce themselves and, and check out your channel, Lou. Well, thanks a lot, Tim. I really appreciate that. Anyway, 
hey, you got my phone number, so if you guys ever find yourselves down in West Tennessee, give us a shout. Sounds good, yeah, and at the very least, we'll have to keep in touch. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate appreciate you reaching out, and uh, I look forward to staying in touch with you, Lou. Me too, Tim. It was a pleasure to speak with you this morning. Me too. Thanks, Lou. Uh, thanks, buddy. Take care. Thank you all for tuning in to tonight's segment of What's Your Story?